Today, we're going to head deep into the Arctic Circle to talk photography with my friend Dave Williams on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. Thanks for joining me. I'm Steve Brazel. This show, as with every show that I do, the show notes are at the website, behindtheshot.tv. Just find the show you're looking for, click the link, and on each individual show, I write a small bit about my guest. I've got all the links related to my guest there. A small sample gallery of their work is there as well. If you're watching on YouTube, it is a little bit different there. I can't put the entire blog post on YouTube, but if you head down below the like and subscribe buttons, you'll find the description area. And in the description are any links that relate to this show. Uh, and as well, there are chapter markers. So if you want to jump to a specific area in the show, please feel free to do that. Just use those chapter markers, jump to the talk about the photography, you know, the, the photograph we're talking about, or the interview with Dave, or the, the speed round of questions that I usually do at the end. Help yourself have fun. I want to bring my guest in because he's a friend of mine. This is his third appearance on the show. I'd like to welcome photographer and educator and author Dave Williams to the show. Dave, how are you, buddy? Hey, yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro. Uh, it is nice to have you here. I want to get uh, to know you a little bit for those that that don't know you. And and I should mention, there's a little lag today. Dave is in, are you in London proper right now? Um, I'm within the M25, but it's not London. I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge. Okay. So yeah, you're in that area. We're going to talk about photography in the Arctic Circle, but because of the distance and the connection we've got today, there's a little bit of lag. So those of you that are listening on audio or watching on video, we do apologize if we step on each other a little bit. Hey, it's the internet. It happens. I mentioned this is your third time on the show. You've been on twice mm -hmm. before, or Aurora yep. and the Night Sky, which is fitting for you because you yep. wrote a book on the Aurora. We had the shot from Iceland with the waterfall and the Northern Lights. Yeah, gorgeous shot. And then the second one we did was the bridge. Yeah, over in Scotland, the Glen... Finnan Viaduct, the, the Harry Potter train. Yeah. Harry Potter train and bridge. And that episode was called The Traveling Photographer. There's links to that in the in the show notes if you head to the website. But what have you been up to since that last show? Because I've watched your Do North series on YouTube. I know that you've got some stuff going on with the person whose place you're at right now, Kirsten Lutz. Mm -hmm. Catch yeah. us up to date. What what has Dave Williams been up to? Um, since the Glenfinnan Viaduct, that was at the very beginning of the first due north, and I've now done two due north. I've spent two winters up beyond the Arctic Circle in the van that I converted, Coffee Fern Bay, a uh, green Mercedes Sprinter that people keep seeing on the road and tagging me on Facebook and Instagram, which is cool. Um, so I've been up into the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, um, in this van. I haven't gone to the top of Norway in it because I was more interested in looking at other things, uh, most notably spending as much time as I could in Lapland and in Lofoten. Um, but yeah, I've, I've done that. But in between, I went the other way. Um, I went out um, into Croatia, uh, Bosnia, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and explored the opposite end of Europe as well and had some great uh, Great little road trips through France and Italy as well. There's, Steve, there's been so much going on. It's been crazy. And if people have not seen your Due North series, it's you basically filming your life on the road because you live in this van, right? So this is, it's your home, it's your studio, and it's how you do all of your work traveling around. This What's interesting to me is this Due North series led to something you're doing with Kirsten. Kirsten for those of you that don't know Kirsten Lutz, uh, and he's in the room there somewhere. Kirsten Lutz is the host of the Camera Shake podcast. Fantastic podcast. I'm honored that I was actually a guest one time on that. He also does the uh, Three Heads in a Row project. And when he was on Behind the Shot as a guest, we talked about one of his self-portraits for Three Heads in a Row. But this whole Do North thing that you're doing kind of led to you doing something with your buddy Kirsten. Tell us about the workshop you got coming up. Um, so while I was in Lofoten, I was networking quite heavily and um, I got to know some local guides, entrepreneurs, hotel owners, restaurant owners, and it enabled me to put together um, a, a bunch of local suppliers to be able to run a photography workshop up there, which is something I've been looking at doing for quite a long time. The thing that makes it different, however, is 
um, instead of like, there's so many workshops in Lafote, and it's crazy. They're they're all the same, and they're all around the same price. So with the connections that I've got and the networking that I did, I've been able to match the price of all the other workshops, but I've also introduced some extra elements to it. So firstly, um, we'll go in reverse order here. Firstly, we're going to be going to a reindeer paddock. So it's not just landscapes. It's not just northern lights. It's not seascapes. It's all of that and a reindeer paddock with Sammy reindeer, a Sammy reindeer herder. We're going to go into the paddock. We can stroke them, touch them, you know, feed them and get some great photos. But right. on top of that, due to some connections uh, that I made through Russell Brown, um, Russell Brown being the senior principal designer at Adobe, I've got Viking models coming. So there's six workshops. For each two workshops back to back, there's going to be a different Viking. And these guys, they're like the Vikings you see on Netflix and on, on movies. They're, they're not like historically accurate Vikings that smell funny and just look apart. These guys have got all the armor, the weapons. They do all their makeup. They're like really good, almost like cosplay, but they're incredible. One of them, Rule from the Netherlands, has just been crowned the king of the kingdom of Elfia, which is like a big cosplay thing. So these guys are legit. They look apart. The they even, they like act just like a Viking, like you would expect. So as well as everything that every other workshop has in the photo, like the Northern Lights, the landscapes, the seascapes, the cabins and all of that, we've stepped it up a gear to have a little bit of luxury within the cabins. We've got a beautiful restaurant. We're having a Viking feast, but we've got the Vikings and we've got the reindeer. So it's going to be an incredible series of six workshops and very exclusive, to be honest. I don't know if we'll be able to do it again. Well, what's interesting is, and and you mentioned to keep it in line with the other workshops, cost-wise, you're going to be about in line with the other workshops, which, you know, everybody's yep. going to do those Northern Lights, you know, that type of a thing, the landscape type stuff. Uh, yep. But you've got the models, you've got the reindeer, you've got the high-end uh, lodging. The thing that sticks out to me on the workshop is you've got two instructors with you doing the Northern Lights, which you wrote mm-hmm. a book about. With Kirsten doing yeah. the the portrait side of the stuff, so it's it's. I was looking at this for me to be honest with you, and I got an email mm-hmm. from a buddy of mine. No, I, I'm not going to mention his name because mm-hmm. I don't know if he wants people to know that he's going. But very w- well known photographer goes, yeah. I'm going on this because he wants to go shoot the Northern <laughs> Lights with you. Yeah, cost wise, what are we looking at? You know, fee wise. Okay, so as as you just said, it's priced pretty much the same as every other workshop that goes there. Every other Northern Lights workshop or landscape workshop, they're all around the same price. So I've managed to get, with, with working with these suppliers, I've managed to get the price down so that we're matching these prices but having these extra elements. Um, Norway's very strict, so I'm working very hard to make sure we are licensed and covered by everything. So we are... Um, covered under the Norwegian Travel Guarantee Fund as well. For that to be able to happen, we have to do all of the business side of things in Norway. And for that reason, we're charging a a price in Norwegian krona. So it's 52,500 Norwegian krona, which sits at around $4,800, $4,900 thereabouts. Um, As I say, that because that means all the business is in Norway, that means we're giving the most secure experience possible. Right. We're, we're covered by everything, all the regulations, all the guarantees. Um, so it's, that that does match all the other prices. If you go and have a look around at other workshops that don't have Vikings, don't have reindeer, you'll see that you, they're all the same price. So that's something I'm quite proud of that I've been able to do that. Um, the conversion is 4900 but Steve, discounts. Discounts. to gauge what to gauge what's happening and i want to get people going on this to act on this as soon as possible which is working the, the spaces are starting to fill up but i'm offering five percent off on top of that it's not going to be all the time so i'm going to pull this deal i just don't know when yet so me and kirsten are going to discuss this um five percent off which takes it down to fifty thousand norwegian krona which is about four thousand seven hundred dollars okay and actually here's here's an interesting thing 
the Norwegian krona isn't doing too great at the moment with everything that's going on in the world economically. And it is, um, it's the weakest it's been for about a year, um, but it's going to bounce back soon. So right now, and I don't want this to sound like it's a sales and marketing pitch, but <laughs> right now with the strength of the currency versus the euro, the pound and the dollar, it's a very good time to book. And what's the code for the discount? So um, if you go through to idagewilliams.com forward slash training, when you click on the button to book, it takes you to a, a Norwegian supplier. When you book on there, you put Dave 5, Dave and the number 5 in the box, and it takes 5% off. Perfect. Dave 5, no space, and the link to the training, idavewilliams.com slash training. I will have that in the show notes uh, on the website behindtheshot.tv and then in the description down on YouTube so that that people can find it easy. Uh, for those people, again, you, this is your third time on the show, so most people already know you. You do a lot for a lot of other people out there that we're going to talk about here in a second. But just a quick recap mm -hmm. for those that don't know Dave Williams, your client list includes people like Time and Nat Geo and Forbes, and you work with companies like Kelby One and Platypod, which by the way, we got to talk about something that happened yesterday with Platypod, yesterday from the oh, day yes. that we are recording this, not the day that it airs. But with Kelby One, you do a lot with Scott Kelby's blog. You're, you know, when Photoshop World happens, landscape workshops happen, uh, you know, or conferences happen through Kelby One, you do a lot there. Platypod, you are a Platypod pro as well, like I am. So you're like me. You've had this thing for a while that they announced on Scott Kelby's The Grid yesterday, the uh, the handle. I don't want this to sound like a commercial. That's not it the is. intent. But I literally yeah. used this yesterday. This came, and this, this came on the June North trip. Yeah, it's it's actually a pretty cool handle. People go check it out, platypod.com, blah, blah, blah. Um, so with that in mind, let's, let's kind of dive in a little bit to you. You do classes in writing for Kelby One. Uh, you do stuff for DIY yeah. photography. You've you're an educator. You've done the photography show, Photoshop World, Russell Brown's master class series that he does. But when I think of Dave Williams, inevitably it's the do I don't want to say do north type stuff because I don't I don't mean just do north as in the series that you do for YouTube. Yeah. When I think of Dave Williams, I think of do north in the sense of you're always freezing your butt off. Right. You're always somewhere that's so stupid cold that Steve is like, I'm good in SoCal. Right. <laughs> I when I take my camera gear out into a light mist at a, at a concert festival, I freak out a little bit. So I want to ask you questions yeah. about shooting in the cold. OK, when when you're going into these type of types of environments. What's the most important consideration for your gear? Because obviously you've got cameras and lenses, but you're also a drone guy. Is mm -hmm. Are there things that if somebody wanted to go, you know what, I'm going to try doing this, that they need to worry about, you know, foggy lenses, temperature issues, yes. oh, batteries? Yes. Oh, what? yes. Very much so. Um, so the most important piece of equipment you take into these cold environments North of 66 degrees north, the Arctic, well, it's 66 degrees, 33 minutes, the Arctic parallel. Um, the most important thing you're going to take with you is you, yourself. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to keep yourself warm, safe, secure, and all of that other good stuff. And so forgetting all the things that are going to be going on with your camera, your drone, or anything else, which I will get onto, um, you need to keep yourself safe and warm. And the most, the biggest reason for this is obviously because of your own personal safety. You need to be, um, right. you need to live, <laughs> you need to survive the experience to be able to tell the stories. But secondly, if you're going to be creative, but you're being distracted so heavily by the fact that you can't feel your fingers or your ears or your nose or, you know, anything like that, you're distracted because you're so cold or wet, you're not going to be creative. So you could be out in minus 20 degrees C, which is, something cold degrees fahrenheit um and <laughs> sorry i don't know freedom units i'll, I'll work on that um it, it, you can be out and you know see the northern lights dancing with the most spectacular display in you know six foot worth of snow but you're not going to be able to get some good creative original photos 
if you're too cold and you can't concentrate and focus on your creativity. Right. So the most important things to protect are your hands, back of your neck, your feet, and your face. If they are warm, particularly your feet and the back and your the back of your neck, then the rest of you is going to be just that little bit warmer. Um, and so you can keep up that that focus and the creativity. But in terms of your gear, well, there are all kinds of things that are going to happen, all kinds of things that can help to prevent bad things happening. The biggest concerns are when it's so cold that your phone, camera, or anything else that carries a lithium-ion battery um, doesn't function. Um, you need to be able to either work a, a, around that or have enough batteries to be able to negate that. It is a genuine concern. Um, the coldest I got last winter, funny enough, was the point that the degree Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit scales both meet at the low end, which was minus 38. And I stayed for about 36 hours in those conditions before I decided I'm going to go somewhere else and warm up a little bit. But at that temperature, I had a, a tripod out and I was doing a time lapse of the Northern Lights. And I quickly went out of the van without my gloves on, picked up the tripod, and my hand stuck to it. The camera was focused up on the sky and it was doing time lapse shot. It was doing time lapse in camera. And the screen usually just, you know, flicks through the shots or the light changes as it goes through the time lapse shots. That screen, every image stayed on the screen and merged into one. So our gear does not like being that cold. Right. So we need to be able to negate it. Obviously gloves when you're handling stuff, not you know, I need to take my own advice in this case. Um but gloves when you're handling stuff and lots and lots of batteries or things to keep the batteries warm. Um when you're the other thing that comes with the cold is, and, and particularly changes of temperature, is your lenses will fog up or mist up. There'll be condensation that forms on the outside, and that's a result of going from cold to warm. Um, so if you are renting a car and driving around in the Arctic, or even you know somewhere cold like the Canadian Rockies, not necessarily within the Arctic, you're going to experience these things that screw with the batteries and the lens. So heaters... To keep everything hot, like a, you can strap a hand warmer to the side of the camera or to the barrel of the lens to prevent it misting up and to preserve the battery life. That's going to give you a huge advantage. But other little tips and tricks, like everyone's got a camera bag, and if you look properly at your camera bag, when you zip it up, it's all padded and waterproof, and it's really well insulated. So instead of putting your camera from the outside where it's freezing cold into the front of the car where you've got the heater on and having that sudden shock and change of temperature. If you just put it into the camera bag outside, seal the camera bag and put it into the trunk of the car, then you're not going to get that sudden shock and that sudden change of temperature. And you're going to be able to prevent things like the camera misting up. Either it's going to stay cold in there for the next location when you get there and get out, it's not going to freeze. Or if you're going back to the hotel or something, it's going to, gradually acclimatize and it's not going to damage the camera okay. so there's there's that's a couple of examples of things to consider but the most important thing is they look after yourself yeah that makes total sense and for somebody like me mm. who's you know doesn't have any hair you lose a lot of your temperature from the extremities and the top of your head so for yeah. me a beanie is yeah. critical and i carry two or three that's the other thing is if you lose a glove you've got to be able to figure something out. So I want to get into this photo for today because this is from this area that we're talking about that you're going to do the workshop in. And just a quick reminder for everybody, this show is available wherever you get your podcasts in an audio only form or a video format. So if you're using Apple Podcasts, both of those are available. Feel free to, you know, download either one or both. And in fact, if you're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anything like that getting the show, Please do leave a you know five star rating and a review if you like the show. Some places, Spotify, Google Podcasts, don't support video, only the audio only feed. And in that case, I've always got the video up on YouTube. Uh, just go to YouTube slash youtube.com slash behind the shot, and you'll find the show there. And of course, please again, like button, thumbs up, all of that, subscribe, do all of that type of stuff. So let's jump into this this image for today because 
when you and I were going back and forth, there were a couple of images that we were looking at. And I really wanted to, because this is an area of the world I've never been to, let alone photograph in. So I really wanted to try and pick a shot that in Steve's head was, you know, oh, wow, I want to be standing where you're standing right now. This is the shot that we landed on. So Mm -hmm. I've got so many questions about this. This is Lofoten (laughs) Islands, Norway, correct? Yeah, this is um, a specific location is almost at the end of the Lofoten archipelago. It's a little fishing village called Hemnoy. The workshop is going to be here? Oh, yes. We're going there. Yeah. Okay. Because this shot to me is exactly everything that I picture from being in that area of the world, right? And I'm going to describe it for those of you on audio feed here in just a second. But let's just say you've got these kind of rocky islands, you've got water that's see-through and beautiful and dark and rich. And at the same time, you've got night sky and you've got northern lights. So this is kind of everything. Before I break this thing down and describe it to people, tell us about capturing this shot. So there was a race to see who could get this shot first between myself and Scott Kelby. Scott got there first, but I think I did it better because he <laughs> got it during the day. He didn't experience the Northern Lights dancing above it. This is one of the most, if not the most, iconic shots of the Lofoten Islands. It's, as I said, it's the um, island and village of Hamnui. There's a, a big fjord to the left of the image called the Reina Fjord. And then as you look at the mountains disappearing up the coast on the right-hand side towards that second, more northerly patch of northern lights, that's the southern Lofoten coastline. So this is almost at the very tip, not quite. The, it's about 20 kilometers short of the tip. There's only two more towns beyond it. Um, and yeah, the, getting the northern lights dancing above that location was something I had to go there several times for until I finally got it. Um, and I've, since then, as you can see over my shoulder, I've managed to get a few more shots of the Northern Lights there. And what's magical about that is that every single time the Northern Lights come out, they look different. There's a different display of the Northern Lights. So you can see there's a swirl in the one over my shoulder here, but you've got lines or arcs in the picture that we've got here. So it, it's one of my favorite places to just be. Um, Because it's one of the most popular, iconic locations in the Lofoten Islands, it does get visited a lot. So it's not one of my classic sort of off-the-beaten-track Eiffel Tower effect shots where I'm trying to create something completely different. It's it's more a case of trying to represent a familiar location in a unique way. Um, And the way I'm doing it in this shot is relying on the sky. But there's a lot going on in here that, okay, first of all, you called it a town or something like that. I can't remember the term that you used. Looking at this, it looks so small from a village point of view. It looks like there's less than 20 buildings here. Mm -hmm. People live here, obviously, year round, make their living here, make their, you know, create their families here. What's the population of this? Do you know? Oh, um can't be that much no i don't i so so the i can i can hint that there's probably about in that spot in where those buildings are there's probably about 50 people and the reason is the red buildings at the front are all like hotel accommodation they're all okay they're red red fishing cabin which is the norwegian term for a uh fisherman's cabin um but then Behind that, there are some houses, and then behind it further still, there's a small harbor. So there are some people living there, but really, really not many because it's mostly um, hotel, Airbnb sort of accommodation. Okay. So for those of you on the audio feed, I'm going to describe this shot to you, but let me just start with saying, go to the website behindtheshot.tv, scroll down to the gallery on this post. And really look at this photo, because what makes this photo to me is all the individual pieces adding up. This is one of those scenarios where the sum of the whole is greater than the individual parts, right? There are so many small, amazing parts in this photo. It's a standard landscape type ratio photo. You're in the Arctic landscape. 
area, right? Bright night sky full of stars and an aurora that is going from full left to full right at the top third, like left of the frame to the right of the frame, almost exactly at the top third. Just below it, also kind of at the top third, snow-covered mountain range. Now, the snow-covered mountain range starts higher on the left and tapers all the way down to the right side of the frame and ends just at the right side of the frame. And here's here's where this gets really interesting lighting-wise is it's in the distance, the mountain range is. It's very cool, very cool temperature, you know, color temperature. It's dark. It's separated from what's in the foreground we'll get into in a minute. Also, dead center in the frame, in the middle of that mountain range, but in front of the mountain range, a really large rock formation. Also, in the back, it's darker, but you're starting to move towards you and the color temperatures are changing. So the the ridges in the back, the mountain range in the back is really cool temperature. This is not warm, but it's not as cool as the rocks in the background. And then the lower two thirds is kind of split down the middle of the image, a little more of the land area on, on the right than there is of the water on the left. But the lower two thirds, there is a dark, very cool body of water on the left. Okay. Inside the lower left third, you can actually see through the water. This water is clear. You can see the rocks underneath the water about at mid frame come up. And as they come up out of the water, it starts to fill the lower right two thirds with, you know, land, but it doesn't look like land. Like we think of it as dirt. It's like you've built a small village on top of rocks is what it actually looks like. And then the famous red cabins, we've all seen them in pictures before, are scattered amongst these rocks. It is an extremely wide angle shot. You're up above the village, shooting across the top of the village so that you can see the rocks, you can see the water on the left, you can see the the, the village. There's a small hill in the village with a tanker on top that I'm guessing is either fuel or water. Behind that, you can see the marina. Then you get to the large rock. Then you get to the mountains. Then you get to the nighttime sky. I'm talking stars and the aurora. The layers in this thing, absolutely insane. And here's one of the things that I think also makes the shot is you've got these, the the land is making leading lines, but in the front right-hand side of the village, you can see the road that enters. You can see a billboard that has a sign on it. Um, The back right, that hill has that tanker on top. It's like an 18-wheeler type tanker. And the colors in the entire image are so inviting. This is what I want in a landscape. This makes me wish I was standing here taking this picture. Did I miss anything though? That's exactly the reaction I wanted. I want, in every photo that I take, the aim is to make the person want to be there because to me, travel photography is unique in that it's, it's a genre that encapsulates other genres. So a travel photo can be food, it can be sport, it can be uh, a landscape, it can be a nightscape, it can be a portrait, anything can be a travel photo. It's not right. so much about what the subject of the photo is, it's more about the feeling that you um, evoke from the person looking at the picture. And the ideal, uh, the ideal response, the ideal feeling you want the person to have in travel photography is that you want them to be there in that place because that's where you're going to be making money as a travel photographer. Companies that produce magazines, companies that sell tours, um, holiday vacation companies, even books about you know history and culture and heritage of certain places, they're always looking for pictures that make you want to be there because that's how they generate their revenue. And therefore, for me to generate revenue as a travel photographer, I need to convey that message. So the fact that you want to be there, Steve, that has ticked that box perfectly. Yeah, it's so good. Now, I looked at the EXIF data, assuming that I read it all correctly. You did this with a Nikon Z6, Z6. Yeah. 
Uh, 14 to 24, 2.8 at 14 explains the super wide yep. angle. Manual yep. uh, exposure mode. White balance was at yep. auto. Center weighted yep. metering. I want to come back and circle back to that one. Shutter Fine. of six seconds. Aperture was wide open, 2.8, and the ISO at 3,200. So a couple things I want to talk about here. First of all, that six okay. seconds. Okay. Yep. This The six-second shutter, this water is like glass, like amazingly yeah. like glass. And yeah. visibly, you can see through the water. Then we go to the center-weighted metering. Now, it's a raw image. You've got latitude and dynamic range all over the place. But why did you choose center-weighted? I'm assuming, depending I, on how you crop this, center-weighted was the center of the frame that I'm seeing. Yeah. It's more that I didn't choose a metering mode, to be honest. It's more that that was just what the camera was on at the time. So um, the two that you mentioned kind of link into each other. So when it comes to metering, uh, a scene for the Northern Lights, it's more a case of um, artistic creativity rather than being technically correct. So when you're taking a good portrait of somebody, you you want the meter to read everything correctly um, right. so that you can just get on and get the shots correct in camera uh, and not mess about with the client or the model or whatever it is. However, when I'm shooting the Northern Lights, I'm looking at the image rather than looking at the data. So changing that back to the six seconds, I treat the Northern Lights a little bit like a waterfall in the fact that the Northern Lights are quite a dynamic subject. They can at times be more dynamic, move a lot more than at other times. And it, on, on this particular day, they, or at this particular time when I shot this one, they weren't moving all that much. They were kind of shimmering laterally across the sky. So that meant the next consideration was the water. And behind where I'm standing taking this photo is open sea, um, the, the North Sea, the Norwegian Sea. It's open water, and it comes straight in, and one of the first things it's going to hit when it makes landfall is these rocks here. So depending on the tide, that's going to determine, and the, the tide and the movement of the water, that's going to determine how much motion there is, whether I'm going to, capture the motion freeze the motion or smooth it out and so because this water was barely moving i must have just caught it at the right time um, at the low tide i believe a, a low neap tide so not a, not a big tide but a, a low tide um the, there was just some undulation in the waves they weren't crashing they weren't rippling over the rocks and so i didn't need to go all that long so for the water, six seconds was fine to smooth it all out. It gave me enough in the water that I was able to get the reflection of the northern lights that you see on the left-hand side. But then using my waterfall theory for the northern lights themselves, when they are very strong and dynamic, when they're moving and dancing and literally ripping across the sky sometimes, you, you apply the same principle that when you want to freeze or blur or smooth out a waterfall in that you have a longer exposure for a smoother shot and a faster exposure for a, freezing that motion um, it's just a slowed down version of that the same principles apply but just on a slower scale so six seconds was enough to deal with the water and enough to sort of still retain some detail in the northern lights so that's how i arrived at the six seconds and then from there knowing that i'm I want to capture as much as I can. That's why it's always wide open on f2.8 unless the northern lights are really bright or you're shooting it. You can shoot in a city with the northern lights, with city light with the northern lights above if you adjust your aperture to deal with the amount of light that's available. So that only left me one thing to change, which was the ISO. And the ISO ended up being 3,200 to get everything balanced to reflect the six seconds at f2.8. Okay, but here's where I'm confused because... I understand the long, you know, the, the six second exposure for the water, for the Northern Lights, that all makes sense to me. And I, it, I actually really dig kind of the, the tie in that you, you approach the Northern Lights like it's water. Like that makes complete sense to me, but six mm -hmm. seconds and still got the night sky. 
And most people aren't shooting nights. I mean, I'm not talking it's a Milky Way shot. It's not a Milky Way shot. It's not 30 seconds, but mm -hmm. but still, even six seconds to get the amount of star cover that you got here, is that because yeah. the light pollution is so low that it enabled that to come through? I'm really trying to figure out how at six yeah. seconds you got so many you know, elements in this, including the night sky. Yeah. So um, the, the the sky, the edit on the sky has enhanced the contrast a little bit to give the difference between the darkness of the stars. Um, but the uh, ISO 3200, six seconds, is going to give you that sort of detail. Um, most notably on a night that the, where the moon is absent. If you've got a full moon using that shutter speed and uh, ISO combination at f2.8 don't forget so it's wide open um you might ris risk having it blown out or having the the ground where the moon is shining being blown out so six seconds on a, a small moon or a no moon is good enough for a bright a relatively bright display of aurora but I'm just going to point out on that note that if the northern lights are incredibly strong if you use ISO 3200 and f2.8 you might be changing your shutter speed to half a second and still you'll still get the detail because don't forget I, the development of cameras and camera sensors has come a long way and this isn't the dslr this is a mirrorless camera the sensor on it is very very good um, as is almost every mirrorless camera you can get and so you are going to be able to get enough detail in that raw file that you can enhance it in post right. with the adobe lightroom or photoshop i'm just going to point out as well because we mentioned platypod this shot was taken with a platypod. So I had, um, if I just remove the handle, I had the platypod on a railing with the camera on top, and I secured everything to the railing with a platypod strap. And I had the camera sitting there looking at the view mounted on this rig right here. So this, this and a camera is all I needed to be able to get that shot, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I... I... I would argue it is pretty cool, but here's, okay. So let's, let's take this to the next level. Okay. Okay. You've got this thing. You had the wherewithal to strap your camera down. You've got your platypod, the newer platypod, which I love, by the way, it's sitting next to me. Um, but the way that you assembled this, the way that your mind works, it's not even this shot. I mean, let's be honest. It's kind of everything that I see from you. But the way that you assembled this shot, this multi-zone, multi-layer, this is graphic design. It's photography composition on steroids. Uh, let me let me let me show something here. For those of you watching on video, this will make sense. If you're not on video, I'll try and can I, word my word my way through. Yeah, go ahead. Can I can I just preempt what you're going to say? Okay. This was the opening page a double spread in end photo, the Nikon magazine to a 12 page article I wrote about photographing the night sky. And I think you're about to point out why. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. But compositionally to me, <laughs> let, let, let's yeah. see if I do. Let's see if I do. Compositionally <laughs> to me. All right. If you look at the left third of the image, that's the water, right? And then if you look at the right third of the image, You've got the lit up hill and the road, and dead center, you've got the, the village. The top third of the image is where it gets fascinating to me because this, this mountain range comes right across, and it tapers down as a leading line. That mountain range starts high, tapers down towards the village, pointing effectively like an arrow at the freaking village. Like, wow. Then... You've got the night sky and everything above it. This rock in the middle is in the perfect spot. The lower third is where you start to see, you know, the village disappear and go into pure rock and pure water. And then not only do you have the thirds here, but you've also got, let me clear that it's not clearing. There we go. Not only do you have the third, the, the, the thirds here from a, a two-dimensional point of view, but then I have no way of drawing on this to explain this. You've got that layering, right? Where you move from the bright rocks into a darker area, but you see the lights on the buildings into the mid-tone 
darker, large rock catching the warm light from the village, but cooler than the village, into the mountain range, which is way darker and way cooler, into the sky, and you even see some of the aurora down behind the mountains. Compositionally, this is brilliant, dude. Were you, did, did any of that actually enter your mind or is this just subconscious? No, I, I try and shoot with graphic design in mind as often as I can. So um, unless I've got a, if I'm commissioned to do a particular thing, I'm going to do that thing. The rest of the time, I'm going to look at how I'm going to sell this photo. I need to make money to eat. Okay. So, when I was the composition that I've got here, referring back to the magazine that I mentioned just now, that gap across the top above the Northern Lights, on, if this is a double page spread in a magazine, which it has been, it's, it's been a double page opening spread to a 12 page feature I did for Nikon. That bit across the top is where you would write the title. And oh, then yeah. the, the, the crease straight down the middle cuts through the mountain. So essentially the right-hand side of that spread, you've got the village. And then the left-hand side, you've got a load of negative space where you either put another image or you put copy, you put text. Right. And that is where the introduction to the article went in this particular case. And shooting in that way, thinking about these things. So as well as artistic composition, thinking about the use of the image and leaving headroom, copy space, so negative space. So you want to think about other pictures, titles, where the text is going to go beside everything. That's why it's like that. That's why it looks like that. Well, like and I can been, see the... That could have quite easily been a tall crop like this one. Right. But having it wide like that meant, well, that means I've got another place, another use case to be able to sell that image. I can even see the graphic designer laying the text in for the title and going, you know what? I'm going to have the mountain in front of the text, cutting out some of the text with the mountain. So, so much goodness here. <laughs> the, there, there's something about the village itself that, that I don't get. So, yeah. and it could be your post work. I'm not sure, but there's a lot of light at the front of these rocks at the, at the lower part. I don't know where that's coming from. And then the village itself, I, I understand there's lights on the buildings, but the roofs of some of those buildings are lit up as though there's a light above them, which there clearly is not. Oh, Where's oh, that light oh, coming oh, from? Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> really? So, as I said, this is, one of, yeah, this is one of the most iconic places. And one of the reasons it's one of the most iconic places is because it's so easy to get to. I'm standing on a bridge that hops from that island over to the left to the next island of Sekrasoy. So it goes from Hamnoi to Sekrasoy. This bridge arcs up and goes down. It's one of those typical Norwegian high bridges over the sea that you've seen, I'm sure, in uh, magazines or whatever. And it's lit. There are street lights all along the bridge. So you, you see that there is light coming from my location into the scene from those streetlights. And it's interesting because it, when you're shooting at 14 mil or something extreme like I was shooting at, it severely limits the angle you can place your camera at. You can't face that way or that way because there are lights there. So you are left with using what you've got in front of you and moving laterally through the bridge to create the scene, create the layers and line up the composition that way so if i'd gone left the island would have been further on the right the mountain would have been further on the left due to parallax or if i'd gone right everything would have lined up to that mountain so it really makes you think hard because of the restrictions that are in place so you won't see any photos in any other direction from that location because of the, the street lights what about the buildings what put the light on the roof of the buildings that's what it's coming. It's a six second strong ISO exposure. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, so what would you have done to this? In. What would you have done to this in post? Every um, Northern Light shot, I play around with the white balance. The, the, there's a kind of rule that 5,600 Kelvin is about right for the Northern Lights. But 
um, different people perceive green most notably in different ways. And so I like to enhance the green where I possibly can. And so the first thing I do is I'll click auto in the white balance box, see what it looks like. And then I'll go down to tungsten and fluorescent because when it comes to these tones, they are the most interesting. I'll find the one I like the most and then I'll change the white balance from there. Unless I have to do it accurately for like newspaper type work, then I'll be creative and find the one I like the look of and uh, change it from there. It then quite often is a case of removing the sky or, you know, selecting everything but the sky and changing, um, making edits there. When it comes to the sky itself, I will use the tried and tested S curve method where you decrease the shadows and increase the highlights, give it a little bit more punch, a little bit more contrast. It tends to make the stars stand out a little bit more as well. Interesting, interestingly. Um, but other than that, it's, when it comes to northern lights and nightscapes, it's all artistic. So it, brushing over things, using using masks to figure most things out. Most of it's done in Lightroom. Before I'll even get into Photoshop, it's mostly Lightroom, mostly global adjustments. So you mentioned people perceive green differently. Yeah. I'm red green colorblind, so I it, which does not mean I don't see green or don't see red, but I see green very, very differently from somebody that's not colorblind. And so mm -hmm. maybe that's part of the reason I love the processing on this is because I can see it and it pulls it into my mind on what I would see. When you're traveling doing this type of thing, are there any apps that you can't live without? Um, the Space Weather Live app, which tells me about the space weather. So I know when the Northern Lights are coming. Um, and the, the local weather app, and that's about it, really. So, in order to see the northern lights, you need a clear dark sky. Excuse me, a clear dark sky, and you need solar activity. So, the Space Weather Live, which is the NOAA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Association, yeah, administration, yeah, close enough. I got very close, <laughs> but they they've got some satellites in various uh, points in space that are looking at the sun and measuring the solar wind that comes towards us. Um, the Discover satellite, and there's another one at the L2 point, which looks side on at the sun. Um, they give us the best data to figure out when the northern lights are coming, along with the magnetometers in the Earth. But all that data is within the app, and all the information about how to read that data is in my book. Anyway, the terrestrial weather, so the local uh, weather service, is going to give you the most reliable information about clear skies. And then the only other factor, like I mentioned, is it's going to be dark. So those two apps, the local weather app and the uh, space weather live app, are the only two that I constantly use. Apart from that, I'll just be scrolling Instagram waiting for it to happen. <laughs> yeah. Which counts. That kind of counts. All right. So first of all, amazing image, right? Like really honestly, amazing image. The, the, the layering and graphic design stuff, there's a lot of images I love that don't do that but my god when you when you add in that multi uh multi elemental composition just really really well done let's switch gears i want to go to a speed round answer these as fast as you can the top cold climate photography tip you have keep yourself warm so that you can stay creative if you're not if you're cold, you won't be able to focus on your creativity. So keep yourself warm. Okay. Biggest photo mistake you've made or almost made? Photography rather than photo. I killed a camera in a waterfall the night before I was supposed to go and shoot some Arctic foxes. And then the following day, I was going for a flight in a helicopter. This happened in Iceland. There was a waterfall inside a canyon. And I wanted to go and shoot a selfie of me standing on a rock in the canyon with the waterfall, but there was so much water incursion into the camera, the camera died because of the temperatures going hot, cold, hot, cold. And so I killed a camera, cost me four thousand pounds. But I learned a valuable lesson from the Icelanders is Fetaredash, which means everything's gonna be fine. And I ended up being able to borrow a camera to shoot the Arctic foxes and go on the helicopter ride. Oh, at least it all worked out in the end. Uh, favorite out. composition rule if you have one? 
um, Fibonacci spiral. It's um, it's right there. Oh, hold on a second. So he's got the Fibonacci spiral uh, tattooed onto the inside of his wrist. I love that. Yeah, and I'm I'm a Fibonacci you spiral know, fan too. You know, I said Fetteradash is the Icelandic where everything's going to be fine. That's on the other arm. Oh, see, this guy's committed. <laughs> You're way more committed to photography than I am, apparently. What is your what is your favorite source of inspiration? Um, uh, social media, because um, it tells me what not to do. <laughs> That's a good one. Favorite band or performer? Ooh. Um, overall, the Foo Fighters, because they are just they're just magical. They uh, I listen to them all throughout being a teenager and I can't find a single tune that doesn't work. <laughs> so they're always in my ears. Yeah. Fantastic live, by the way, favorite movie or TV show. I was, I was meant to go to them live in London and it was that time that Dave Grohl broke his leg and yep. so he canceled. I'm like, damn. Anyway, favorite what? He's like, he's show? like, but really quick, <laughs> isn't he like the coolest damn guy on the planet? Right, oh, yeah. breaks his leg, comes I back out on stage, yeah. finishes the show. Yeah. I yeah. I need to have a beer or a whiskey with him sometime. Again, uh, favorite TV <laughs> show or movie? Um, um, the Office, but the US version. Interesting. Okay, favorite drink? Um, coffee. There's one. It's <laughs> drinking it right now. Last question: Is there mm-hmm. a photographer out there? that you think more people should know about? Yeah. And he's in the room, so I don't want to say it too loud. <laughs> Go for it, because he needs, yeah, he it's, needs it. And he's been on the show it's before. Kirsten. It's Kirsten. The, the magic he can do with a, a off-camera flash it blows me away. Like, when I'm, maybe it's because I'm more about landscapes and stuff and not, hang on, what? The show, oh, that's amazing. He's showing me a picture now. He's listening. Damn. Um, <laughs> So I can shoot a landscape and I can shoot the Northern Lights and I can shoot food and I can shoot all this stuff that doesn't talk. But you give Kirsten a person and a, and a flash and his like, magic is all over it and it's whatever you envision, you can make it happen and I find that incredible. And then I look at his recognition and followers and stuff and I think you should have way more. I agree on that one. People should go follow it. Kirsten Lutz. His podcast is Camera Shake Podcast, and also on Instagram, along with Kirsten Lutz, three heads in a row. You got to check that one out. You know, he needs to wave in. Call him over to the camera really quick. Do you, do you want to see the picture he's just showing me? Yeah. Yeah. Pull it up. Hey, Steve. What's up, buddy? Hey, man. How are you? Oh, good. Good Steve, to see you. you. You've you even got there. a Camera Shake. Well, Dave, you don't have to leave. You've even got a Camera Shake uh, podcast sweatshirt. That's kind of cool. Uh, no, all right. Wow. So here's one I made earlier. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> well, so this, yeah, is the, this is the stuff that Kirsten Lutz does. So you got to go follow <laughs> Kirsten Lutz. And he's been on the show before. You go check out that episode. Yeah, and I can make this whilst you were talking today. So that's, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. All right, Kirsten, good to see you. And I will be seeing you when I'm, when I'm in town. <laughs> Get out. Stop stealing my show, dude. Right. I'm back. <laughs> You're back. Uh, Dave, I appreciate it so much. Where can people find you? Uh, idavewilliams.com or um, idavewilliams on any social media. And I mean any. I might not be very active on TikTok, but I am there. Um, Instagram is the big one where I look around, and I've got a Facebook group as well. So idavewilliams for any platform. Okay. And then- idavewilliams.com also has a link on the front page to the workshops. Which is what I was going to ask. So the, the workshops is idavewilliams.com slash training. But if yeah. you follow me, if you follow Dave, I've been sharing it. He's been sharing it. It really does look like an amazing workshop. Again, Dave 5, no space in between, just D-A-V-E 5, gets you 5% off the workshop. Dave, dude, it is always so good to see you. And I will be seeing you face-to-face coming up in, uh, oh, just over a month. June. Yeah, it's going to be good. Looking forward to it, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. I've had a lot of fun and I'm 
always blown away at how you describe photos. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Make sure you go follow him. It's idavewilliams.com, idavewilliams.com slash training, idavewilliams on social media pretty much anywhere, although he's not on Mastodon. I need to get him on Mastodon. If you want to follow me, you can do that as well. It's at Steve Brazel, like the country Brazil, but two L's, or at Behind the Shot TV on pretty much any social media out there. I happen to be on Mastodon, uh, the podcast. I don't have a Mastodon account for the podcast, but that one's on Facebook. And it'll, yeah, put it this way do a search. You'll find it that way. But again, thank you very much to my guest, Dave Williams, this time around. Make sure you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. Thank you.